Good morning. So, Kate, I really appreciate how reflective you are and just making that data super transparent. It actually is not something you see in all conferences, so that's really great to see. So, um, I am going to take um, this morning just to talk and have a discussion and try to be a little free-flowing. I put some slides together. I can put some slides together really, really early this morning. Uh, it's been an interesting week in Boston. And um, so let's, let's kind of engage a bit. Um, so I was told that there are over 500 participants from over 20 different states here. So I want to get a sense of who's in a room. How many of you are classroom teachers or school site administrators? Okay, wow, the vast majority. How many of you are central office administrators? Central side. And how many folks like, do deliberate coaching? Like you're responsible for adult learning in buildings or in school systems. Okay. And so today my hope is to kind of provoke some thinking. I, my intent is to be provocative and I'm not going to make, I'm not making any policy statements today. I think I just want to be super clear. Um, sometimes when a superintendent speaks, people think that it's, oh, there's a policy coming up. No, there's no policy coming up. I just, I truly just want to be a learner and a thinker today. Um, I want to thank all of you for making the commitment to be here. I know for those who are from Boston Public Schools, raise your hand if you're from Boston Public Schools. There's 150 of you. <laughs> thank you for your commitment because I know you're away from your families this week because we are on break. Uh, for those coming from other parts of the country, I hope Boston has treated you well. Um, I know Kate was probably keeping her fingers crossed that we didn't have any crazy weather, and it's been pretty non-eventful, but two weeks ago, I called my first snow day. It's my first experience, and I be instantly became the most popular superintendent among kids. Um, but it's been good so far in Boston weather so far, um, and it should be pretty nice today. It's going to be in the 50s. So I officially started as a superintendent of Boston Public Schools about seven months ago. So I'm fairly new and I have the privilege of leading the first school district in the country. And um, we're just honored that Boston is holding, uh, hosting this event. Hopefully um, you guys will return. So here's what we're gonna do in the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna start with the why. Um, I'm gonna move to the how and I'm gonna talk about a few what's and that's kind of Simon Sinek's thing, right? Um, and I'm gonna end also with a kind of a personal story and go back to the why. Um, again, I'm gonna ask for permission to be a bit provocative. I, I hear you've had some other speakers that have been provocative, so maybe uh, I really don't need to be asking for permission all that much. So, let's see. So. I know Kate began this conference by sharing some data and grounding us in the urgency of our work. And for me as a leader, I remind myself every single morning when I wake up why we, I do this work. And I do, we do this work, all of us do this work, because ultimately it's about, it's, it's about kids' lives. It's about it's not just about closing achievement gaps. It's guaranteeing that kids have the opportunity to be successful, meet their potential in college, career, and life. And so I know that some of this data was shared with you earlier, but I, I took a look at the slide deck that Kate shared with you, and it's, it's shocking. Like a data point like that where students living in circumstances of poverty by third grade, if they are not reading or 13 times more likely to not graduate from high school. And then I know you saw this, and I'm thinking 1979. My brother was born in 1979. He's 36 years old. And this is what's happened to our country in the last 36 years. Like, we can't, we can't afford to ever have a child be disengaged from the learning process. And this is data from Boston, and folks haven't seen this, but this piece of data came from an Annenberg report a couple of years ago, and 
there's so much, it was such a rich data set. It's about black and Latino boys and their achievement in Boston public schools. I just pulled out one slide. This talks about suspension rates. And if you do some math and you divide 2.9 divided by 0.1, that's, I believe that's 29, right? So 20, so black elementary boys are 29 times more likely to be suspended than a black elementary school boy. That's shocking. I mean, it, when we look at high school, I guess it gets better. It's, the, it's only a nine times difference. 900%, 900% difference. But we're not, kids aren't dropping out. They're being pushed out. But this data isn't just, I mean, it's not just Boston data. If you look across large urban school districts, you see the same sort of things. Now, the reason for these figures are myriad. We, we, I don't want to pretend that as teachers and as administrators that we have all the solutions, and, but we're not powerless. Right? We, we have immense influence in the lives of young kids when they are in our schools and when they are in our classrooms. Now, let's get into the how. So we talk in Boston about cognitively demanding tasks and how we want kids being involved in CDTs. But I think teaching itself is cognitive demand, especially teaching in 2016, when we're trying to meet the needs of such diverse learners in our classrooms. We design, teachers design, they implement curriculum experiences in order to deepen and develop student understanding. We're coaching for understanding rather than act as those who dispense information we create instructional goals, we figure out methodology, materials, assessments that work for every single child, not one size fits all approach. It's, it's hard work. It's cognitive demanding. And hopefully this week your brains are hurting. Like you have had to really work your brains. But I also think teaching is highly political. Right? Folks always ask me, why would you do the job of a superintendent? So political. I'm like, when I mess up and I say the wrong thing to oppress, I may get some flack for it. But as teachers, when there are 15 students with their hands raised saying, I know the answer, and you have to make a decision on one child who answers, that's a political statement you're making. And when there is a student that's distracted or maybe even being defiant, you have to make a choice whether to engage or disengage that child. That's a very political statement. What piece of literature you have your child, or do you have your students read? And how you even give a grade, what grade does a child get? Those are very political decisions. I think there are far more high stakes than decisions I have to make. I'm gonna go get back to the grading piece in a bit. So given the high stakes nature of our jobs, and because teaching is so cognitively demanding, it's so political, I'm gonna make an argument that we actually have to be far more prepared, and invest far more time off stage than on stage. Now, of course, everybody here in Boston knows who that is. I learned very early on, you never say anything bad about Tom Brady, <laughs> and Literally, no matter what the question is that comes to you from a reporter, they may ask you how you're going to close achievement gaps. All you have to say is, Tom Brady has all the answers. Tom Brady does no wrong. Tom Brady was framed. And it's a perfect answer for everything. <laughs> but we know that off stage, a lot of work happens. So like These professions that require far more off stage work than on stage work includes athletes musicians, right? But in teaching, I was just sharing with the group back there, I think in teaching, we, at least in this country, we, our education system isn't designed in a way to actually find, allow adults 
teachers and administrators and coaches the time they need to do the offstage work, especially now. Agree? So I, I, I really do wish our system looked different. And I, I had an opportunity to um, go on this symposium where we visited some schools in Hong Kong and we had a chance to speak to teachers and they spent 50% of their time really preparing before they even go on stage. And so again, I, I commit, I, 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 I thank you for your commitment these last few days to just doing the work off stage. I'm gonna get into some of the what's. And um, did the how, why, kind of the how, which is really focusing on the off stage work. Now, let's talk about what are some of the things here we really should be planning for. And what are the things that we should be conscious of when we are doing planning before we go on stage? I'm gonna actually use the instructional core as a kind of framework to talk about some of the things that we should be thinking about when we're planning for our instruction. And typically, this is Elmore's instructional core. Um, professor Elmore obviously is a professor uh, at prestigious college right across the river. Often, the focus is on each of the circles, right? What is content? What is the teacher doing? What is the student doing? Actually, instead, I want to focus on the lines. I'm going to focus on what we should we be planning for in terms of the teacher and content? What should the teacher and content be thinking about during the planning process? We're going to talk about the teacher and the student. How are we planning for that interaction? And then how are we planning for the content and the student interaction? Okay. So teacher and content, that dash line on the left. It's what you've been doing the past few days. It's engaging in content. Not by just understanding what's in the standards, but actually relearning the standards. Actually doing the math. Actually doing the reading and doing the writing. I actually remember the, our visit in New York a few years ago, and you were telling, Kate was telling me about kind of the path that they had taken in the development of professional developments that they, they were creating in New York. And one thing really resonated with me, and, it's, um, and I kind of remember this, um, let me, tell me if I got this uh, right or wrong. Like in the very beginning, the, when the Common Core first uh, came out, it was, everything was around the shifts. Okay, let's focus on the shifts. Let's make sure there's more informational text to the kids, like focus on the shifts. And then they realize it's not just about the shifts. Adults need to know what actually are in the standards. So the focus then became very standards based. So what's in the standards? What's in the standards? What's in the standards? And then we realized that's not enough as well. It, you, it can't just know what's in the standards. You actually need to relearn the standards because the standards are so different. We learned in such a different way growing up that you actually have to relearn in a different way. So teachers have to be engaged in content in a relearning process in order to build their own capacity to actually plan, deliver, and assess student learning. Second, let's go to, let's go to the teacher and student line. Okay. And I want to talk about the teacher and student interaction in a few different ways. But first, I want to do a quick exercise. Um, there are three lines up there, a green line, a red line, it looks like a red line, and an orange line. Uh, the orange line is A, the red line is B, the green line is C. And on x-axis, let's say that x-axis is weeks in a quarter, weeks in a quarter. And let's say the y-axis is the amount of content that students are learning, content and skills that students are learning. So let me ask you, like, personally, with a show of hands, how many of you were um, A? Meaning when you, as a, as a student, as a K-12 student, that when you entered class, you, you came in not knowing the materials you needed to learn, but over time, yeah, and actually A is you kind of struggle along, you show some improvement, 
But especially towards the end of the quarter or the end of the learning cycle, you really start accelerating. So how many of you were A growing up? I was an A. I think I was an A. Especially as an English language learner, I really felt that. Um, how, how many of you were B? Like you were steady learners. You picked up material all the way and you show mastery over time. How many of you were B? I know this is an oversimplification, but let's just try it. And then C, how many of you came in really, like you had a really good grounding. Like you had a lot of social capital, very good grounding. And you learned, uh, you improved, but you didn't improve all that much. But you still all got to the same point. How many of you were C? C. I know earlier this week um, there was a discussion about growth mindset and fixed mindset learner. If you were a teacher, now go back, now put yourself back in your kind of teacher frame. If you're a teacher and you had class, you had students that in your classroom that show that learning trajectory. Some students came in with little content knowledge, others came in much more, but they all ended up mastering what they should have learned, is did you create a fixed mindset or a growth mindset classroom? Obviously a growth mindset classroom. I'm gonna ask you to just turn to a partner really quickly. What is something you deliberately do as a teacher in your interaction with a student to create a classroom like that? I'm gonna give folks two minutes, just turn to a partner. Thank you, I, I didn't even set that norm at the beginning, it still works, it's great. Um, I'm sure all of you in your minds and were able to articulate one thing that you do in a classroom to be super deliberate about creating that growth mindset environment. But I'm curious, how often do you as a teacher and you as administrator um, actually plan for those moments. Actually deliberately plan to make sure that you are doing what you are doing in order to create that environment. I'm going to give some thoughts about some things, you could, some things that you can plan for. I think it's really important, especially with a common core, that you don't plan for just your very first question. The very, very, the very first question is easy. Like that's how you engage students. Like you engage students by asking a question and somebody will answer and it'll be great and you move on. I ask you to actually plan for the second question. That's actually empowering the kids. That's the difference between engaging and empowering. Plan for that second question. A second thing is really hone in um, on struggle. So when students are in classrooms, and you as a teacher and you're in your interaction with a student, don't be so quick to course correct. Like, let them struggle and watch them struggle and ask them, be ready to ask them, tell me about how you're thinking through this problem. But you have to plan for that. You have to plan for those interactions. And then the number, th the third thing and this, might, this is kind of going into this policy space. I'm not going to policy space. But I'm going to go back to this graph up here. We're going to start with um, C, the green line. If this was a Algebra 1 classroom, that student that is a green line, who thinks that student should I know it's oversimplifying, but who thinks that student should get an A? A at the end of the year, uh, quarter. Who thinks that student should get A? The green line. Who thinks that student should get a B? Who thinks that student should get a C? Okay. Let's get to B, the orange line. Who thinks that student should get an A? Who thinks that student should get a B? Who thinks that student should get a C? How about the bottom line, the orange line? Who thinks that student should get an A? Who thinks that student should get a B? Who thinks that student should get a C? 
Okay, and about two thirds of the room did not vote, but that's okay because I'm gonna ask you to go and engage in a two minute conversation and we're gonna do the same thing again. So engage in a two minute conversation this time with your entire table. Um, let's, let's try that again. This, let's start with A again on the bottom, the orange line on the bottom. Who thinks that student should get an A? Who thinks that student should get a B? Who thinks that student should get a C? Okay, let's go with the red line, A. More hands, B, C. Okay, and then let's green line, A, B, C. I think interesting enough, like the more people participated from my observation, and more folks seem to have voted that all three students should get an A. Now, I know that's arbitrary and it's oversimplification, but if you've created a growth mindset classroom and all kids are learning and they're learning at different paces, but they all get at the same place at the end, shouldn't they all get an A? And so, like, just a bit of advice in thinking about this to planning for this teacher-student interaction, give feedback, not grades. I just stop grading. Give feedback. Just give feedback. I know you're uh-huh, my administrators will not be allowed. I gotta get two grades in the system once a week. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, but I think it just really, I think this speaks to that. Grades are our, kind of some, it's our way of exerting power over students. And we think that grades will motivate students, and I think it does. It does motivate some students. But grading can also really disempower students. And actually, I was at this conference, and I wasn't really a conference, it was a small group conversation recently at Microsoft. And Microsoft has been working with this school district in the Northwest. And they took a look at, they took the, uh, the school district's data and they looked at 49 in different indicators. So they looked at poverty of students, they looked at um, social, uh, uh, they looked at uh, ethnicity, they looked at gender, they looked at what elementary schools they went to, and they wanted to take a look at what had the strongest correlation with dropouts in the, that particular district. You know what it was? Of all the indicators, it was specific grades given in specific classrooms in the district that had the strongest correlation to dropouts. Above poverty, above ethnicity, fascinating, fascinating. Um, last one. Uh, oh, we talked about that. Um, let's go back and talk about the last line, the last line, which is the student and content line. And so um, I got sent that uh, Clint Smith spoken word video yesterday evening, and I watched it, blew my mind. And it actually, I really resonated with me because uh, the assistant superintendent of professional learning, Dr. Donnie Tran in Boston Public Schools, he's been dropping knowledge on me about something called culturally sustaining pedagogy culturally sustaining, not culturally relevant, culturally sustaining. It means to perpetuate and foster to sustain linguistic, literate, cultural pluralism as part of our democratic project of schooling. So in, fa in the face of the politics of the US right now, it just seems like this sort of thinking is far more important than ever before. And I, this morning when I was uh, looking at Twitter, and I look at Twitter in the morning, and I look at the Twitter haters um, uh, that are directed towards me uh, every morning. But I got to this article. Um, it was an article, it was research that was recently produced by Concordia University in California. And it talks about how bilingual students have a far higher sense of a growth mindset because they believe that knowledge is learned, it's not innate. Yet, um, unfortunately, in many parts of our country, 
um, bilingualism, biculturalism isn't espoused. And even with my own personal story, and I think some of you might have heard my bio, my first day in America in, um, in school, I, there was a PE teacher that basically um, mistreated me because of the fact that I didn't speak English. And um, I'm, the unintended consequence of that very first interaction with the very first teacher in the US was like my mom and my dad basically said, you need to stop learning, you need to stop speaking Chinese, you need to stop speaking Taiwanese, you only need to speak perfect English. We want you to be monolingual, and we want you to be monocultural. We want you to be, quote, American. This, I, like, Clint Black's, like, uh, Clint Smith's video really took me back to that moment where that interaction between the student and content, what we are actually having our students interact and how they see the content and how they live and feel the content, is I think something that we need to desperately figure out and we need to desperately plan for. So, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna try to wrap this up. Um, Elmore talks about the instructional core. He talks about the tasks in Boston Public Schools we've been really focusing on how do you elevate the cognitive demand on the tasks. But I think that as a country, we actually need to do a much better job of supporting that. And how, what do I mean by that? Like there's so much attention, so much focus on teacher actions. We evaluate based on teacher actions, right? We, when you look at teaching videos, you don't watch videos of students reading in class for 30 minutes. There's no video of that. There's tons of videos about what teachers are constantly doing in class. Professional development is typically around teacher actions. There's not really a lot of PD around how teachers should actually be planning. I think this institute, though, does try to get to that. So in order for us to really elevate these tasks, we really need to focus on what students are producing, what students are actually doing. So this takes us back to the why of our work. Um, Robert Putnam, who's read this book? I'm just kind of curious. Our kids. Anybody read this kid book? Oh, wow. Okay, just came out 2000, about a year ago, Our Kids, The American Dreaming Crisis. It talks about widening gaps, income gaps, and how widening in income gaps have brought profound but underappreciated changes in family life, neighborhoods, and schools in ways that give big advantages to students at the top and make it much harder for those below to work their way up. The American Dream is dying. And education was always intended to be the great equalizer. Education is meant to be the ones that help us, help kids make sure that they have an equal chance in life. But what the data is really showing us is that that's not happening. And that achievement gaps are just as persistent. Yet our American education system is really designed to be more around equality, not equity. And as I said earlier, like we only have some control over some of this. Like our daily work, we only have some part of it. But what control we do have, we need to make sure we're investing the energy, the time, the brain power to make sure that those moments of time when kids are in front of us are the most powerful that they can be. The transformation of adult learning, like you're experiencing today and what you're experiencing in your schools when you're working with your colleagues, ultimately is going to be what is most critical to transform what is learning, what learning is happening in classrooms. So, thank you. Appreciate your time this morning, and um, turn it back to Kate.